Hello, my name is John Enright, and I'm the Vice Director at SciArc and Principal of Griffin Enright Architects. I'm so pleased to be able to introduce our lecturer this evening, Richard Rothstein. Richard Rothstein is the author of The Color of Law, a forgotten history of how our government segregated America. A distinguished fellow of the Economic Policy Institute and a senior fellow emeritus at the Thurgood Marshall Institute of the NAAA, NAACP Legal Defense Fund. In addition to his recent book, The Color of Law, he's the author of many other articles and books on race and education. Previous influential books include Class in Schools, Using Social, Economic, and Educational Improvement to Close the Black-White Achievement Gap, and Grading Education, Getting Accountability Right. Richard's book is an extremely well-researched and sobering look at the myriad of manners that systematic racism has influenced our urban and suburban environments, creating segregated communities and suppressing African-American people. I believe it is a must read for our times, and I hope it will continue to be part of our collective cultural core curricula for years to come. I'm happy to announce that the student union is making available 100, 100 free copies of Richard's book, the Color of Law, to all SIRC students attending the lecture. And in case he's not going to plug it, I'm going to plug it for him. Here's my copy, dog-eared and all. <clears throat> uh, those will be given out on a first-come, first-served basis, available for pickup starting tomorrow, Thursday, and through next Wednesday at the Santa Fe entrance from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. daily. I want to thank the SIRC Student Union for extending the invitation to Richard. And I want to thank him for accepting and spending time with us tonight. He is also stuck on the East Coast, I'm informed, because his home is in Berkeley, but he has been out there now for a few months. Thank you. And so now please give me, uh, join me in giving Richard Rothstein a warm welcome to SIARC. Well, thank you very much, John. And thanks to all of you for the interest you have in engaging in this conversation with me uh, this evening. Uh, let me begin by uh, reminding you uh, that in the 20th century, we had a civil rights movement in this country. It began by challenging racial segregation in law schools, then went on to challenge racial segregation in colleges and universities. And then in 1954, won a Supreme Court decision that prohibited legal segregation in elementary and secondary schools. And that Brown versus Board of Education decision in 1954 gave inspiration to a movement of activists, a civil rights movement that engaged in marches, demonstrations, civil disobedience. People lost their lives in that struggle. Others were severely injured from beatings of, of police and of local law enforcement forces. Uh, but by the end of the 1960s, that civil rights movement had persuaded much of the country, not everyone, but much of the country, that racial segregation was wrong, it was immoral, it was harmful both to African Americans and to whites, it was incompatible with our self-conception as a constitutional democracy. With that understanding and with its uh, militant but nonviolent tactics, it succeeded in winning the desegregation of public accommodations, public, trans public transportation, uh, uh, employment, uh, and in 1968, in the wake of the assassination of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, it got a Fair Housing Act passed that prohibited ongoing discrimination in the sale and rental of housing. And then at the end of the 1960s, that civil rights movement pretty much ended and left untouched the biggest segregation of all, which is that every metropolitan area in this country is residentially segregated. I've lived in many of them. Everyone that I've lived in had clearly defined areas that were all white or mostly white, clearly defined areas that were all black or mostly black. How could it be if we persuaded the country that racial segregation was wrong, immoral, harmful both to African-Americans and to whites, incompatible with our self-conception as a constitutional democracy? How could it be that we left untouched the biggest segregation of all? Well, I suppose part of it, you could say, is because it's hard to desegregate neighborhoods. If we pass a, an ordinance prohibiting segregation of restaurants or buses or trains, 
the next day you can sit anywhere you want in the restaurant and ride any on any train and sit anywhere you want on a bus. But if we pass a law prohibiting segregation of neighborhoods, the next day things wouldn't look much different. So what we've done, all of us, and I mean all of us, African-Americans and whites, liberals, conservatives, northerners, southerners, Democrats, Republicans, all of us have adopted a national rationalization, an excuse we give ourselves for failing to confront this biggest segregation of all. And the excuse goes something like this. We tell ourselves that the segregation of public accommodations and transportation, uh, schools and colleges, that was all done by government. If the federal government was doing it, it was a violation of the Fifth Amendment to the Constitution, civil rights violation. And as American citizens, we have an obligation to remedy civil rights violations. If state and local governments were doing it, it was a violation of the 14th Amendment, also a civil rights violation, and something that we as Americans have an obligation to do something about. But residential segregation, we tell ourselves, that's something entirely different. That wasn't done by government. It wasn't done by law, by regulation, by ordinance, by public policy. Residential segregation just sort of happened naturally by accident. It happened because bigoted white homeowners and landlords wouldn't sell or rent to African-Americans in white neighborhoods, or maybe uh, banks, real estate agencies, uh, developers, uh, even architects, private uh, individuals, private businesses uh, discriminated in how they uh, carried out their private sector activities. Or maybe we tell ourselves it's because blacks and whites just like to live with each other in the same race. We feel more comfortable that way. And uh, that's why we uh, live in segregated neighborhoods. Or maybe we say it's income differences, economics. Uh, African-American incomes on average are lower than white incomes. And so it's the case that many African-Americans can't afford to live in white middle-class neighborhoods. All of these individual, bigoted, private sector uh, activities, uh, self-segregation, uh, economic differences. This is what created residential segregation, we tell ourselves. We give it a name. We say that what we've got uh, when it comes to residential segregation is de facto segregation, something that's just happened in fact, not in law or policy. Well, uh, I spent many years uh, as, as a, a you heard John when he introduced some of the previous work I did uh, describe uh, studying education policy. I didn't really know much about housing until maybe 10 years ago. Uh, I was the education columnist at the New York Times. I was writing education policy for a number of think tanks in Washington, DC. And much of my work concerned what I thought was a ludicrous national consensus we had on um, problems facing American public education. The biggest problem, we said, was an achievement gap between black and white children. On average, African-American children have lower achievement than white children. And we told ourselves that the reason we have this achievement gap is because teachers have low expectations of black children and they don't try very hard to teach them. Uh, this was actually our theory. It sounds ludicrous today, I know, but this was the theory. It was enacted into law, the 2001 No Child Left Behind law prescribed annual testing for all children, and we're going to hold schools and teachers accountable for their test scores. And the law predicted if we simply hold teachers accountable for their test scores, their expectations will rise, they'll try harder, and the achievement gap will disappear in about seven years. That's what the law said. Well, it's now 20 years out. The achievement gap isn't much different than it was in 2001 when we passed that law. Uh, the reason uh, it didn't work is because the theory was completely flawed. Of course, there are some teachers who have low expectations, who don't try very hard to teach black children. But that's not the important reason why we have an achievement gap. The reason we have an achievement gap is because so many African-American children come to school with social and economic disadvantages that inhibit their ability to take advantage of what the best schools have to offer. And I remember writing one column uh, uh, about asthma. As you may know, African-American children in urban areas have asthma on average at about four times the rate of middle-class children. Uh, four times the rate, it's an enormous difference. And they have asthma 
because they live in more polluted neighborhoods, more trucks driving through their neighborhoods, more dilapidated buildings, more vermin in the environment, more empty lots kicking up dust. And if a child has asthma, that child is more likely than a child who doesn't have asthma uh, to be up at night wheezing, uh, coming to school the next day drowsy. And if you have two groups of children who are identical in every respect, identical groups, same racial composition, same social and economic background, same family structure, same economic circumstances, but one group has a higher rate of asthma than the other, that group's going to have lower average achievements simply because on average, it's drowsier in school. It doesn't make a big difference. But when you think of all the other uh, conditions that uh, children from low-income families in low-income neighborhoods come to school with, asthma, lead poisoning has a measurable impact on IQ, homelessness, economic insecurity. You add all these up and pretty much you've explained the achievement gap, leaving a little bit left for low teacher expectations. Well, I began to realize it's one thing if a child has asthma or lead poisoning or homelessness or economic insecurity. But what happens if you have a school where every child has one or more of these conditions? How can you ever expect a school, no matter how many laws you pass, how can you ever expect such a school to have that same kind of achievement as a school where children come well-rested, well-nourished uh, from economically secure homes uh, in good health? You can't have that expectation no matter how many laws you pass. Well, we call schools where we concentrate children with those disadvantages, we call them segregated schools. And schools today are more segregated than they have been at any time in the last 45 years in this country. And the reason they're more segregated is because the neighborhoods in which they're located are segregated. So I began to think that maybe neighborhood segregation was an educational problem. It was a problem of educational policy and something that people like me should be concerned about. And then in 2007, I read the Supreme Court decision that evaluated uh, policies of two school districts. Louisville, Kentucky, and Seattle, Washington. Both of these districts had a very trivial school desegregation plan. Uh, they allowed parents to choose the school that their child would attend. But if the school was going, their choice rather, of the school was going to intensify segregation, the choice wouldn't be honored in favor of the choice of a family that wouldn't. So if you had an all white or mostly white school, and there was one place left in that school, and both a black and a white child applied for that last place, the black child would be given some preference. Trivial program, you don't have one place left in the school very often and you have to choose between a black and a white student. But the Supreme Court evaluated this program, denounced it, said you couldn't do such a thing. The controlling opinion was written by Chief Justice John Roberts. He explained that the schools in Louisville and Seattle were indeed segregated. He said the reason they're segregated is because of the neighborhoods in which they're located are segregated. He was right about that. He called it de facto segregation. And he said, we well, have de facto segregation caused by private bigotry and the actions of private businesses and self-choice and income differences. We have de facto segregation, something that wasn't created by government, no civil rights violation there. Government is prohibited from doing anything to fix it. Well, I read this decision and I remembered reading about something that happened in one of those two cities uh, some years before in Louisville, Kentucky. There was a suburb of Louisville uh, called Shively. In, it was an all white suburb of single family homes. In that suburb, there was a white homeowner who had an African-American friend living in the center city of Louisville. The friend was a decorated Navy veteran, had a wife and a child. He wanted to buy uh, a single family home, but nobody would sell him one. So the white homeowner in the suburb of Shively bought a second home in his community and resold it to his African-American friend. And when the African-American family moved in, an angry white mob of neighbors surrounded the home protected by the police. They threw rocks through the windows. The police made no effort to inhibit this activity. They dynamited and firebombed the home. Police made no effort to restrain it. But when this riot was all over, the state of Kentucky arrested, tried, convicted, and jailed with a 15-year sentence, the white homeowner for sedition for having sold a home in a white neighborhood to a black family. And I said to myself, this doesn't sound to me much like de facto segregation. If the police, the criminal justice system, 
the courts are all mobilized in a, a conspiracy uh, to enforce racial boundaries in Louisville. This is a 14th Amendment violation. These are all agents of state government. And I began to look into it further, and I found that it wasn't just in Louisville, Kentucky, this one incident, and I'm not exaggerating here. In the 20th century, there were hundreds and hundreds of cases, not just in border states like Kentucky, but in New York and Baltimore and Chicago and Detroit, and Kansas City and Denver and Los Angeles and San Francisco, cases of police protected, sometimes even police led and organized mob violence designed to drive African-Americans out of homes that they had legitimately purchased or rented in white neighborhoods. Every one of these was a civil rights violation, a constitutional violation, a 14th Amendment violation. Uh, state actors protecting, organizing, uh, leading mob violence. Uh, every one of them, uh, as I say, is a civil rights violation, and we have an obligation as Americans to remedy them. We never have. We've never taken up that obligation. Well, I began to look into it further, and I found it wasn't just state-sponsored violence that created and maintains the racial boundaries that we have in this country today. But uh, there were many, many federal, state, and local policies, all of them racially explicit, that uh, created, sustained, reinforced, and perpetuated the racial segregation that we know. We're an apartheid society, not de facto, but because of unconstitutional, followed by policies of government at all levels. I don't have time uh, in this talk to uh, describe many of these policies. Uh, uh, they are uh, described in many of them in, in my book, uh, The Color of Law. But let me focus on uh, just a couple, if I have time, uh, uh, and um, give you an illustration of the kind of policies that our government followed in the 20th century that we've all forgotten about. The subtitle of my book is A Forgotten History of How Our Government Segregated America. It was no secret at the time. It was out in the open well known to everyone. Uh, we've forgotten about it, as I said earlier, I think because uh, we don't know what to do about it, and so it's easier to ra easy to rationalize the history away. Perhaps one of the more powerful policies was a policy of the uh, federal government in the post-World War II period that was designed to uh, suburbanize the entire white working class and middle class populations into single family homes in all white suburbs like that one that I described before uh, outside Louisville, Kentucky. This was a racially explicit policy. Uh, after World War II, there were millions of returning war veterans coming home, needing housing. There were also many whites living in urban areas. So we weren't a suburban country at that time. Uh, uh, most whites and blacks lived in uh, downtown urban areas and broadly, um, frequently in broadly integrated neighborhoods. We'd be stunned if we were transported back to that period to see the extent of working class integration that existed in this country at that time. They were all living in the same urban neighborhoods because we were a manufacturing economy. And factories had to be located near deep water ports or railroad terminals to get their, sh their parts or ship their final products. The banks that service them and the other white collar service industries also needed to be located in that area. So the workers and the employees in these industries had to live close enough to be able to walk to work. They didn't have cars. Uh, they had to take either walk to work or take short streetcar rides to get to their places of employment. Well, the federal government decided as the returning war veterans are coming home uh, to move the entire white working class population out of urban areas into single family homes in all white suburbs in a racially explicit federal policy. And you're familiar, I know, with all of these uh, projects or, or with the fact that we suburbanized the country in this period. Uh, places like in the East Coast, perhaps the most famous is Levittown, east of New York City. In the Los Angeles area, Lakewood, uh, near uh, Long Beach, um, uh, Westchester on the west side of Los Angeles, uh, Panorama City and the San Fernando Valley, all of these were federally created suburban communities for whites only uh, in the post-World War II period. These developers, uh, William Levitt in Levittown, east of New York, or uh, Mark Taper, uh, the philanthropist in the arts, the developer of Lakewood, uh, none of these developers could have um, 
found the cop capital to buy the land and uh, build the housing on their own. No bank would be crazy enough to lend it to them. We were in a suburban country at that time. They thought these were crazy ideas to build suburbs like this. The only way that these developers could get the capital to buy the land, build the houses, in the case of Levittown, for example, 17,000 homes, uh, Westchester and Lakewood are a little bit smaller than that, not much. Uh, the only way they could get the capital was by going to the Federal Housing Administration and Veterans Administrations, submitting their plans for the development, uh, the construction materials they were going to use, the architectural design had to be approved, the layout of the streets, and a federal required commitment that they would never sell a home to an African American. The federal government even required these developers to place a clause in the deed of every home, prohibiting resale to African Americans or rental to African Americans. If uh, any of you happen to live in a, a home that was built in the mid 20th century, early 20th century, look at the deed. You'll see you're living in a building that was uh, created for Caucasians only, not enforceable anymore, uh, but that's how the federal government required these developments to be constructed. Um, with uh, the approval of the federal government to build these homes, the federal government uh, uh, would guarantee bank loans for Levitt and um, Taper and the other developers. And uh, with these guarantees, they could go on and construct the project. Uh, the white families who were permitted to uh, buy into these homes uh, bought them inexpensively. It was uh, they cost about eight or nine thousand dollars a piece in that at, in those days. Uh, in today's money, that's about a hundred thousand dollars. These were homes for working class families of typically 750 square feet, uh, two bedrooms, one bath. This policy of requiring uh, whites only to participate in the program, prohibiting African-Americans from doing it, was not the action of rogue bureaucrats in the Federal Housing Administration or Veterans Administration. It was um, uh, written out in a policy manual of the Federal Housing Administration called the Underwriting Manual, distributed to appraisers all over the country whose job it was to evaluate the applications of developers, builders, to um, get federal bank guarantees uh, for their projects. Uh, the manual said explicitly, you couldn't recommend for a federal bank guarantee a, a, a development that was going to include African-Americans. The manual said further that you couldn't even recommend for a federal bank guarantee a development that was going to be for whites only, for all white, if it was going to be located near where African-Americans were living. Because in the words of the manual, that would run the risk of infiltration by inharmonious racial groups. Uh, in my book, The Color of Life, a photograph of a six foot high, half mile long concrete wall that a developer was required by the Federal Housing Administration to construct uh, in Detroit, in the Detroit area, to separate his project from a, a nearby African-American neighborhood. And only upon construction of that wall would the Federal Housing Administration guarantee his bank loans to, to uh, build the project. Uh, this was, a, 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 as I say, a racially explicit program implemented all over the country, created a white noose of suburbs around every metropolitan area. Uh, the notion of de facto segregation is other nonsense. There's no basis in reality to it whatsoever. Uh, we are an, an apartheid society when it comes to residential residences because of a federally explicit, uh, racially explicit federal policy. Well, as I said, those homes cost in today's money about $100,000. Uh, as you know, uh, they no longer sell for $100,000. You can't buy a home in Lakewood or a Panorama City or Westchester now for $100,000. Uh, they cost that anywhere from three hundred, four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars in some parts of the country. Uh, up where I live in, in um, uh, Northern California, a million dollars or more. Uh, the white families who bought those homes gained over the next couple of generations wealth because the homes appreciated in value. They had mortgages, long-term mortgages, amortized mortgages. Returning war veterans were required to make no down payment to get into these homes. Uh, so the appreciation in value uh, was uh, retained entirely by the white homeowners. They used the wealth that they gained from this appreciation to send their children to college. They used it to um, perhaps uh, take care of uh, temporary emergencies, maybe unemployment, uh, 
temporary, maybe a, a medical uh, crisis. They used it to subsidize uh, their retirements, and they used it to bequeath wealth to their children and grandchildren, who then had down payments for their own homes. African Americans were prohibited, prohibited by explicit federal policy from participating in this wealth generating program. The result is that today, African American incomes on average are about 60%, 60% of white incomes. African, you, you would think that um, uh, African American wealth would also be 60% of white wealth. Families can save the same amount of money from the same incomes. But in reality, although African American family incomes on average, are about 60% of white family incomes. African-American household wealth is only 5% of white household wealth. And that enormous disparity between the 60% income ratio and the 5% wealth ratio is entirely attributable to unconstitutional federal housing policy uh, practiced in the mid 20th century that we've never remedied, that we've never accepted the responsibility to remedy, be fogged as we are by the idea that this never happened, that um, whites just happened to move to these suburbs and African Americans just happened not to. That's our myth. Well, the, um, that policy uh, that created this enormous wealth gap still determines much of the racial inequality today. Uh, it's no longer the case that federal policy refuses to insure mortgages for African Americans, but African Americans health that enables them to move to these suburbs, which are now unaffordable to working class families of either race after the rise in, in prices of these homes. Uh, the wealth gap is responsible for the achievement gap in schools that I uh, tried to uh, describe to you earlier. It uh, concentrates uh, most disadvantaged families in single urban neighborhoods without the, the wealth that enables them to move to higher opportunity places. It predicts also health disparities between blacks and whites. Uh, African-Americans, as you know, have shorter life expectancies, greater rates of cardiovascular disease because they live in more polluted, more dangerous neighborhoods. The wealth gap that concentrates African-Americans in single neighborhoods and excludes them from higher opportunity places is also in large part responsible for the mass incarceration of young African-American and Hispanic men and uh, for police abuse that we spent so much time demonstrating and about and marching about uh, last summer in the wake of the murder of George Floyd in, in Minneapolis. Uh, I'm not suggesting to you that the police officers would never abuse African-Americans if it weren't for segregation that's reinforced by this wealth gap, but uh, it would be much, much less intense when you concentrate the most disadvantaged young men in single neighborhoods where they have no access to good jobs or the transportation to get to those jobs, or schools that aren't overwhelmed by the social and economic problems of their students. It's inevitable that the police are going to engage in confrontations with those young men, that they're going to adopt the habits of occupying forces um, anywhere in the world, like colonial forces in India or the Congo or any of the colonial um, uh, countries, uh, colonies of, of European nations uh, in the 20th century. This is uh, the kind of uh, practices that police everywhere use in those situations where they have to control a low income, uh, uh, discriminated against population. Um, and the wealth gap also has another effect, which I think is, a, well, I'm sure you do as well, very frightening, dangerous. And that is the very, very extreme uh, uh, political polarization we have in this country today. It's not entirely racial, but it largely tracks racial lines, as you know. How can we ever expect uh, to develop the common national identity that President Biden called for in his inaugural address? If so many African Americans and whites live so far from each other that we have no ability to empathize with each other, no ability to understand each other's life experiences, how under those circumstances can we ever uh, develop uh, the national uh, common identity that we uh, need to preserve this democracy? So those are some of the consequences of the wealth gap that we created. Uh, let me take a moment to describe uh, one other policy uh, very briefly uh, 
that uh, the federal government followed. I, I can't spend too much more time on it. But um, during World War II, hundreds of thousands of uh, workers flocked to centers of war production to take jobs in war industries, jobs that hadn't existed during the Depression. In particular, uh, in California, uh, we had large shipbuilding and aircraft uh, industry, and uh, there were hundreds of thousands of workers who came to California uh, to take jobs in those industries, black and white. Uh, the federal government segregated the housing for those workers. They overwhelmed places like Los Angeles and San Francisco and Portland and Seattle. Uh, if the government wanted the ships and the planes and the jeeps and the tanks to be produced, it had to find housing for these workers, and it did. Everywhere it created this housing, it created segregated housing, separate projects for African Americans, separate projects for whites, uh, creating segregation that hadn't previously existed. These were for workers who were working in the same shipyards and aircraft carrier, air aircraft uh, uh, factories, rather, uh, but living in segregated housing at the federal government's requirement. Uh, in San Francisco, the San Francisco Bay Area, where I uh, come from uh, now, in San Francisco itself, the federal government built five projects for war workers. Uh, four were for whites only, one for African-Americans, creating segregation where it hadn't previously existed because there were very few African-Americans living in California anywhere prior to World War II. It was the second great migration of African-Americans uh, from the former slaveholding states into um, California that produced the, uh, the first significant black population uh, in this state. Uh, the same policy was followed in Los Angeles. Uh, Watts came to be known as a black neighborhood. It wasn't black neighborhood before uh, World War II. That's where housing for war workers was placed, creating a, a black neighborhood that hadn't previously existed. Uh, workers were working at the um, uh, Douglas Aircraft Plant in Santa Monica. Uh, they wouldn't put housing for those workers near there. They placed it in Watts, and that became the black neighborhood of, of Los Angeles. Well, let me uh, say that the policies to redress segregation are well known. There's no mystery about them. Uh, think tanks, uh, policy experts uh, spin out ideas for remedies all the time. What's missing is not the uh, policy ideas about how to redress segregation. What's missing is a new civil rights movement that's going to make it as uncomfortable to maintain patterns of residential segregation as the civil rights movement of the 1960s made it uncomfortable to maintain the segregation of public facilities and transportation and uh, employment and other, other institutions. Um, what can the civil rights movement do? Well, I say the policies are well known. I can give you a couple of examples. Uh, Take the, the all white suburbs that were created that are now unaffordable to African-American working class families, even to white working class families if they don't have down payments from their parents. The, um, uh, those suburbs uh, sold at the time for $100,000, the homes, they now sell for three hundred, four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars $500,000 perhaps. The federal government should, as an affirmative action policy in housing, designed to remedy the unconstitutional practices of the federal government in the 20th century, federal government should be buying up homes in these suburbs at whatever the market rates are, 300, 400, $500,000, and selling them to, at deeply discounted rates, prices, to African-American families who could afford to live there if they were selling at the kinds of prices that whites were able to purchase um, and African-Americans were prohibited from doing. So that would be a narrowly targeted remedy for a very explicit constitutional violation, completely uh, constitutionally justifiable. We're not doing it not because we don't know what to do. We're not doing it because there's no political support for it. Um, another po At the low end, we have policies that uh, reinforce segregation for low-income families. Uh, the uh, um, Biggest one is a program of the uh, Treasury Department. It's called the Low Income Housing Tax Credit. Some of you are probably familiar with it. Uh, it's a program that uh, subsidizes developers, nonprofit developers, of, uh, to uh, create uh, housing units for low income families. <clears throat> the Treasury Department regulations absurdly uh, place a priority in pla on placing low-income housing tax credit units in existing low-income neighborhoods, reinforcing their segregation. 
That's the opposite of what its priority should be. Of course, we should place better housing in those low-income neighborhoods. Every neighborhood should have better housing. But we shouldn't place a priority in placing those low-income housing tax credits only in those neighborhoods. We should be placing a good share of them in high opportunity communities for families that want to live in them but cannot afford to do so. Uh, I am involved with a, um, a group of national civil rights uh, and fair housing leaders to create something we call a new movement to redress racial segregation, whose mission will be to create new local civil rights groups that will make, its, make their focus uh, the um, demand, uh, the pressure to create the kinds of policies in their own communities to redress segregation. I'm working on a new book that describes the kinds of policies that we should be insisting upon. Uh, as, as I proceed, I've been writing articles uh, uh, about these policies. One, for example, describes a community in California that um, uh, is, was created as an all-white community uh, in the 1940s uh, and where we can identify the bank, the real estate agency, the developer, all of which still exist today, um, that contributed with the federal government to the segregation of that community uh, on an all-white basis. It's just now unaffordable to African-Americans. But that bank, that real estate agency, that developer should be pressed to create a voluntary fund to subsidize the movement of African-Americans into the community that it excluded that these institutions excluded African-Americans from moving into in the mid 20th century. I can uh, send you a, a link uh, if, if I don't know, if, uh, John, if you have a follow up uh, to this uh, people who registered uh, for this uh, session. But if, if you do, I can send you a link to this article and to others uh, like it or even to um, uh, the, uh, the um, uh, new movement to redress racial segregation, which will be launched in just a couple of months. And if anybody is interested in receiving information about it, I can send you a link for that. Um, for example, and I'll give this as a final example. Uh, in the course of writing uh, my the book, The Color of Law, I examined textbooks that are used to teach American history in high schools all across this country. Every one I examined lies about this history. It um, promotes the myth of de facto segregation. They promote the myth of de facto segregation. They boast about the great work that the federal government did in uh, creating suburbs, never mentioning that it was for whites only. Boasts about the work that the federal government did in creating housing for workers in the mid 20th century, uh, never mentioning that it was always on a segregated basis. Well, we've created a uh, curricul curriculum units that can be used uh, in high schools. And every one of you, lives in a high school district and can, if you wish, uh, get together with some of your neighbors and friends and examine uh, how this history is being taught or mistaught in your local schools and uh, take action to um, insist that your schools uh, reform the way they teach it. Because if the next generation uh, doesn't learn this history any better than we have, they're going to be in as poor uh, position to remedy it as we've been. Uh, with that, uh, I'll stop, and uh, I understand we're going to go into a, a, a question period and answer period, and I, I want to thank you for your attention uh, to this presentation. Thank you.